Hey, this is episode nine of Hoopfolio Podcast. This episode, I talked to former GB international Flinder Boy about his journey from Fairfax, LA to Team GB, right through to his final year as a pro in the Greek First League. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the YouTube channel Hoopfolio to get notified of future episodes and any feedback as well in the comments. Flinder, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you're all the way over in LA at the moment, right? That's correct. Uh, I am, yeah. And what's uh, wh- what's it like over there with COVID nineteen? Tell everybody in Ireland and the UK what's what's it been like in LA. Probably no different, I, but just with a beach. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, it's weird because normally you've got traffic all the time and smog. I mean, you don't have any of that, which is actually really nice. Uh, but it's a ghost town. I mean, you go down some streets and it's just completely empty, which is a little bizarre. Um, it's hit LA pretty hard in terms of California. So we're going to be on lockdown. They say at least through the summer. So we're getting comfortable. What else can you do? Yeah. Right. And then what about like, so like in terms of the economy, the local economy in LA, yeah. there's a lot of, entertainment and stuff like that that some of that ceases right is so is there talk about that locally in the newspapers like you talk to people they, is there a concern around that the economy will it pick up afterwards or is that kind of a i don't think there's a huge concern in that industry because i mean you look right now everybody what are they doing they're, they're watching streaming services they're watching netflix and hulu yeah. and um so i think that industry is going to bounce back everything has to shut down for right now um so i don't think anybody's too concerned about that um you know it's the rest of the economy that people are worried about every right. every other kind of job you know the, the unemployment numbers here i'm sure like in ireland are are nuts right now yeah yeah i mean so it's gonna it's gonna be a while till things get back to whatever whatever the new normal is yeah, whatever new normal is, yeah, whatever that's going to be, who knows? Um, I th- yeah, from that point of view, as I was asking, I was thinking, yeah, I suppose the entertainment industry isn't going to really suffer. The, it's going to pick up right where we left off, and the demand should still be there for for, for everything that's happening. In sure, the and it's industry. like, I mean, the things we should worry the least about are, are the entertainment industry and the sports industry and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's going to be fine. Mm. It's the first thing people are asking about, right? The UFC did a did a show there. They were the first kind of organization, sports wise, to go. We're going to do this irrespective of the lockdown. I actually watched this. It was really strange without the crowd. Um, yeah, I mean that's and now they've got Fight Island coming up, and everyone's going to be on Fight Island. I mean, it seems like one of the few sports where you could probably pull that off, right? Because it's, yeah. it's only it's a small amount of people. I mean, here they're talking about restarting baseball season, and you know, even basketball, I mean, you have so many people, not just the team, but the trainers and the doctors and the coaches and, you know, mm. the people driving the team to the, to the, to the, to the games. And I mean, the amount of people that are in contact with the team every day is, is high. And if a yeah. few people get, few people get, you know, COVID-19, what do you do? You shut the whole league down? Yeah. I don't know, man. It's, it's difficult questions are coming up. Yeah, and it's the same for college sports as well with, in terms of teams, whereas, as you said, UFC, you can be one guy and then the staff is maybe his coach and two other guys. So you've got smaller units. It's easier to manage. Never thought about that, actually. Yeah. It's okay. still, I mean, it's bizarre. You're watching that with no fans, though, right? It was really strange. Bruce Buffer's the, the announcer. I don't know if you know this. You probably do. Uh, and right. I think I said this on the last episode as well, but it was just so strange seeing him, like, um, and he just announces them in, in this, like, you know, his usual kind of high energy way. <laughs> just right. nothing, just like a lead balloon, like tumbleweed moment. And it's it's just weird. And then you could hear the coaches, too, talking to the guy. And the other guy could hear what he was saying to do. And it's just like you could hear the, the exactly what the coach was saying. So it's just a, just adds a different right. dynamic to it. But you get, you get over it after about 10 minutes. They're still hitting each other in the face. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's the same stuff <laughs> but, right um, just Ends no crowd the, the other thing was there was no crowd reaction so when someone did get hit the commentators almost were like joe rogan and those guys were almost 
trying to add to it more to get some kind of an atmosphere behind it because there was no crowd cheering when one guy started to get momentum. So that was a bit strange as well. Right. Uh, anyway, I don't know how we get on to UFC or <laughs> actually get ready to talk about basketball. Uh, so, right, we go back to the start. So you're from, you're from LA, we've established that. Uh, a few points here. So your parents are from the UK originally. That's correct, right? Yeah, yeah, my father, yeah. Okay, your dad, all right. And he gave you the name Flinder, which I had never heard until I met you. I thought that was a fantastic name. I still do, by the way, every time I look at my phone. <laughs> was there any, any, yeah, any exactly. rationale behind that? Was your character from a Yeah, you know, my, it... my, no, my parents, before I was born, they lived in, a, they lived in Scotland, actually, up in a, near a town called Inch, which is near Aberdeen. And they lived in a house called Old Flinder. So uh, when I was born, they named me after the house, which apparently is an old, you know, Scottish word uh, that means um, like splinters or a piece of something larger. So Flinder, that's me, okay. splinters. Splinters, okay, because there's a word, there's a, not the app Tinder, but obviously Tinder, like, fi like fire, you say that you put the Tinder in the fire, not the app, nothing to do with the app. But okay, so Flinder. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I, actually, I actually looked at your name, Boyd, and I know I lived in Scotland for six years. I might have told you this before, but then I th think I was saying that I'm sure Boyd's a Scottish name. In fact, we definitely had this conversation. I, I <laughs> just get the yeah, play back. <laughs> it is, it is. Although, although that's not really my family's name. They changed. You know, I have like a Russian great grandfather. Great grandfather changed it when he moved to England from Brodsky. Uh, okay. So it's not. That's not really. I don't really have. Scottish family, but yeah, I know okay. there there are the Boyds. Cool. Yeah. Okay. There is Boyds for sure. Billy Boyd is a famous actor. He was in Lord of the Rings. He's one of the hobbits. And, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, interesting sidetrack there. So then the probably the start of it will be high school, right? Is that when you started playing basketball, or was it actually before high school? Uh, I started playing before. Um, I mean, I played, you know, baseball, football, basketball growing up. Um, I was probably baseball was my best sport when I was a kid, but it kind of got too slow for me. So I wanted to play basketball, which was probably like my worst sport out of the three, but I just loved it, man. I, I, I worked on it every day. It was kind of, it became a passion really quickly. Okay. And you went to Fairfax High School, which is in, again, research, West, West Hollywood, which um, Fairfax... Is it, is it a, I read it was like a, like a Jewish district. Is that right? Is that right? Uh, traditionally, yeah. I mean, it's everything shifted, you know, the way cities shift. But yeah, traditionally it was, it was, you know, kind of going back to like 60s, 70s, 80s. It was primarily a Jewish school. Okay, cool. And then the high school. As, um, as they do. Yeah, they, they tend to evolve these, these things. Um, so the high school itself, uh, you just, did you get involved then? I, I don't really know how it works in college, but you have a seventh grade, eighth grade. Uh, whereas in Ireland, it's kind of like under 14, under 16 schools. So what point then, were you on the high school team from the start? Or how, how did that work? Yeah, for yeah I mean, I, 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 so ninth grade was the first year of high school. So I played on the varsity team. There's varsity J, junior varsity. I played on the varsity team from ninth grade uh, onwards. Um, but I mean, on a, to kind of go off on a tangent, I always thought it was, I always thought it was better the European way of where you have under 14, under 16, under 18, and you're playing for a club or you're playing for a district, you know, rather than your high school. Um, I don't know, because you're, 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 you're with the same players from the time you're like 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, you're kind of growing and building with those players where, it's not always the way it, it works out here. Um, everything's attached to your school. I mean, that being right. said, it's easy to switch to a new school, but you have to switch to a new school if you want to change your basketball team. Where in Europe, you could stay at the same school and just switch to a different club. Yeah, it's generally run a lot more through the clubs here. Well, I mean, if you... If you're lucky enough to go to a school that has a little bit of like a basketball pedigree in it or a good coach that you've had good teams over the years, then your school can can be the spot where you grow a lot. But a lot of times in Ireland, there's there's a local club that you generally can get better at where most of the best players from each of the schools will go to. So it's sure. kind of club, club focused in that sense. But there are some schools around Ireland where there's a lot of good players have come from as well. Um, okay, so one of the things I was picking up on is, right, 
like the facts, you know, like you're uh, you're like 5'11", is that right? 5'11"? Five, yeah, yeah. 5'11", <laughs> would you describe yourself as like, I mean, I, I only saw you in your latter days, so I actually don't know the answer to this question, but like when you were in, in high school, like you're 5'11", you know, like looking at the looking at guys that go to they go to college, like typically these days, especially is they, they do look at things like height and athleticism. Was were you athletic back then? Were you really quick? Was your like like what were you, <laughs> what were you say from a recruiter's would, perspective? Would, would you would you kind of look at yourself and go, oh, actually, but that they might have thought, okay, maybe he's too small, or you know, those kind of things. I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I was I was very very quick when I was that age, um, I was probably like one of the quicker guys in the city. I, I, although I wasn't a great leaper, I was really quick. Um, but yeah, my height was always kind of one of the things I remember being in ninth and 10th grade and coaches said, coming to me, man, if, if you keep growing, if you get up to like six, one, six, two, like you're going to be a really good player. And, you know, eventually I got to, I got to a point and just stopped growing and that was it. And I kind of had to make do with, 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 with what I had. So, you know, like any smaller point guard, you got to figure it out. You got to be the smartest player on the court or, you know, you got to be quicker than everybody else. You got to, whatever it is, you, you've got to be better on that thing because, height is always going to be an issue in basketball you know guys want to post you up or whatever you know so yeah I, I remember that kind of that split between kind of 10th and 11th grade like am I going to grow am I going to keep growing you know I wanted to be like Scotty Pippen where I had grew seven inches over the summer but it never happened man just topped out at 5'11 <laughs> right, yeah yeah and everyone's kind of got that that in the back of their head maybe i'll grow you know you, like you said you read the stories and was it jordan hanging upside down trying to stretch himself and he was right yeah, right like yeah and it, it does happen for some some guys but like you can't rely on it um so so one of the things that came up then in high school is that you you uh i think you had a record in your high school for assists which which really means that you kind of figured out at a young age okay maybe i'm, I'm not six foot seven and i'm going to be like penny hardaway just kind of going to the basket as a point guard but but you realize that like making other players better and you know the assist side of things is definitely something then you realize from a young age or just we're naturally good at like how did that you know, how, do you, how do you see that looking back now you know man it's interesting I mean you know I think it's like the college assist record I don't know if I have the high school assist or maybe maybe yeah. I do but it's um I mean it's interesting because I love like passing the ball like I looked up the guys like you know, Bobby Hurley and John Stockton and who, who wanted to pass the ball before they did anything. You know, they didn't, they didn't take a lot of shots in the games. And I loved running the team and knowing where guys are going to be and getting on the ball and scoring and, you know, getting every, get the whole team playing as one unit. I mean, I love that. Um, but I think I almost got, I was really good at it because I could see the way everything could unfold on the court, you know, well, if this guy cuts, that guy's going to be open. You know, it kind of made sense in my brain, but I, it was often at the detriment of my own scoring. Um, I think if I kind of would have done it again, I probably would have been more aggressive and, and, and scored more points. Um, I think there's this I, idea sometimes point guards have that you have to be a passer to help the team. But helping the team is just winning. I mean, if you're scoring points – you're helping the team. I heard an interview from Steve Nash and he was saying the same. He said, if I did it again, I would shoot the ball more. I mean, he shot 50, 40, 90. He was an incredible shooter, um, but he wanted to get everybody else involved. But sometimes the best option for a team is, is for the point guard to shoot. So I, I don't know, man. And it's interesting seeing the evolution of basketball where you see guys like, like um, Steph Curry, like Dame, you know, they're shooting. I mean, their first thing on their mind is they're coming down and they're gunning. So, it, you know, I don't know if you're really going to have those kind of true, true point guards like a John Stockton, even like a Chris Paul. I mean, if they're going to exist in the same way, in, at least in the NBA. So, um, yeah, I wonder if I went back now, if I would play differently. Mm. And, and it's interesting to say that you've kind of – a lot of times it's the players you grow up watching that shape 
the kind of player that you want to be at least right like maybe you watched magic johnson more back then and, and maybe he, they were just like moving i went back and watched some of those games recently and just the ball doesn't hit the floor sometimes you know like the 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 uh, boston celtics team with larry bird i mean the ball would just literally ping around and if you watch that yeah. the style is just at, at completely at odds with what exists today which is what you said like point guards are scoring point guards and the ball hits the ground a lot more on the NBA. It's a lot more one on one, and and it, yeah, it's just it's interesting. I, I certainly think now the, the game has been shaped by, and it's celebrated now to be you know a scoring point guard, whereas you know there's a as much as you say like that yet yeah, the scoring you would go back and do more shooting. It's picking your well in my head at least you're just picking your moments right. So you know so there's sometimes when you need to be a pass first guy, and sometimes when you need to be okay, this, right. I need to be a threat or else they're going to stand off me. And, you know, well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's interesting watching the evolution of the game, right? So you got, like, I was growing up in Magic Johnson and the Lakers. I mean, it was gorgeous to watch. He was directing everybody. Ball never touched the floor. You know, and then you, you, you see the way it's evolved for point guards. But when I saw somebody like Steve Nash play, I mean, he was doing things I never even thought possible. You know, he was going through the lane, left-hand floaters, right-hand floaters, you know, up and unders, um, you know, dribbling, going through the other side of the basket, dribbling in circles. I mean, doing things I didn't even think you could do as point as a point guard. And, you know, and then you have Steph Curry, Curry coming after him, and he's doing stuff that was like in our – as when I was when I was growing up, like, would have been in our wildest imagination, you know, pulling up and shooting like that, you know, coming off a screen, um, step back against the big guy. I mean, it's just, I think some of it is like, you have these rare guys that come along and they show you what could be like, you know, what, what, what is what, not just the evolution of the position, but they're showing you um, the possibilities, which is really fascinating. And, and it's, as, as the point guards, you know, I'm a point guard, so I love point guards, but, you know, it's definitely Steve Nash and Steph Curry have just changed the game from that position probably more than anybody in my lifetime, more than even Magic, because how many 6'9 guys are there going to be, right? right? So, I mean, that was his unique trait. But these other guys, I mean, they're, they're, like, they're like all of us, but they're just they're doing it in a way that completely shifts, shifts the imagination, which is just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I might be wrong here, but Steve Nash was definitely one of the first guys to kind of have that kind of early takeoff off the off leg or the wrong leg, you know, just kind of yeah. shoot defenders. And he thought about things a little bit differently and, and just became really, really difficult to guard and, and could still find guys, could shoot the tree, could pull up yeah. mid-range. His mid-range was, was, you know, he talked about that being his bread and butter, just coming in, just hidden hidden shots. And yeah, he, he, was, well, he was an absolute handful. Well, he grew up playing soccer, so it was almost – there was like a fluidity to his game that just I, – I had never seen before, you know. Everything was kind of happening on the fly. He was coming down. There were drag screens. He'd, he'd, he'd fake them, then he'd go under the hoop, and everything was just continually moving, continually like, like a soccer game. So – and now you see all the point guards that play like that. So I, I personally – I don't think he gets enough credit for the way he's, he changed the game, really. I mean, he, 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 he's not really thought about in the way that, uh, of the great point guards. And I wonder if that will change over time. Yeah, it's interesting because I completely agree with what you're saying. I actually saw someone on, um, someone post this. It might have been just a clickbait. Uh, he does a podcast in the UK, and he was saying, that should uh, Nash have gotten MVP that year? I just I mean... I think he should have, but uh, it's well, just interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he won two in a row, and I think the first one he probably shouldn't have won. I, I remember Shaq was much better, but it's it's inter- I mean, yeah. that's a whole other conversation. And yeah. the way we the the way we we judge people now, there's so many analytics you can look at which weren't really around at that time. I mean, it was almost you look at a guy he moved to a new team that year, and all of a sudden they were a much better team. So I guess he's the most valuable. I mean, everything now is the analytics, you can look at, at how all the stat, you know, everything. You look at Giannis and what he's able to do. Analytically, it's like off the charts. Mm, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. 
Um, we've, I don't know how we got onto that, but I, I suppose the point was that that from a well, from from my stats or the stats that I saw, I mean, you, I think you had sixteen assists in a game. I thought that was high school. I'm not sure that was your high school. It was on Wikipedia again. No, that was that was in that was in college. I was in college. Okay. Um, okay, so you obviously um, from high school, then you you had a transition to college to to Dartmouth. Do, do you remember the kind of recruitment process there and, and what you think kind of, uh, you know, got your looks or how that worked for you in terms of transition to college? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? So, um, I mean, for your audience, I'll say it's, I'll share. It's like you get five visits as you're getting recruited. So you have an option to visit five schools all paid for. Um, obviously, those schools have to want you. So one of them was I went to Dartmouth and then I went Harvard and Ivy League and then I visited three schools on the West Coast, smaller schools. And when I went to Dartmouth, uh, I knew I could play right away, which was really important. You know, I didn't want to sit on the bench for a couple of years. And it was just completely different. It was out in the country. I grew up in LA. It was out in the middle of nowhere, beautiful trees. Um, and I wanted that kind of experience, that college experience that felt very like New England, small school, you know, beauty, beautiful campus. I mean, that felt right for me. Um, so I committed early. I committed in the fall instead of waiting through my senior year to see what else could come up. Um, but I, it was just a verbal commitment. And after I committed, then a, a couple big schools recruited me, Oklahoma and Utah. And my mom had gone to Oklahoma and I actually considered it, you know, I took some calls from them and talked to the head coach and really considered kind of getting out of my, my, uh, my offer from Dartmouth and maybe going to Oklahoma because I thought, man, it's a big school. This is a great team. I grew up watching them because of my mom, but ultimately like I knew I wanted to go to Dartmouth and, and, and it was the right decision. We, we weren't great when I was there, my, my four years, but you know, overall, everything, you know, the school, the academics, everything, it was a, it was a great choice. Wow. Um, and Dartmouth is, is, yeah, New Hampshire, which is just north of Boston, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's about a, it's about an hour and 30, 45 minute drive from okay. Boston. Okay, cool. Um, and and this, it's an Ivy League school, so it's good, good education. What degree did you, undergrad, did you do any? I didn't. Uh, I did sociology, which is okay. basically like I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I did sociology. I did a sociology class. It. It, it, I mean, I did a lot of modules at university, and that was – I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just do sociology. should be fine. should be a, a breeze, and it was the most difficult one. And it was an American professor, and really? he, was, he was talking about a, a community that lived off the north you – know, on an island off the north coast of Russia – and started talking about symbolism and he was using words I didn't understand and I left the class after about two weeks and thought I'm never doing sociology that was really difficult <laughs> I don't understand what he's talking about so uh, that was my experience in sociology <laughs> but, uh, yeah I mean I it's actually kind of now now the job I have now it's worked out you know I'm, I'm a writer and a journalist which is it's all sociology all the time you know yeah you're trying to true. you're talking to people trying to get into their brains and and interesting so, so i i guess i really did like it although at the time i just didn't know what i wanted to do so so sociology yeah. seemed like the choice that's good that you could use it in your in your job now it's actually yeah it kind of it's more real life practical use of sociology right exactly cool okay so um so then you so you went to college in dartmouth um you had, I think I checked out quickly. Your last year seemed to be your strongest year, right? You seemed to like almost like get get more. You took more shots. Like it, it looked like you were taking more shots every year in college. That's kind of how it looked. So you were getting stronger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I think I learned. I had to learn at that point, like how much of the game is mental, right? Because I, I feel like. I mean, my first year I played, I was I, I had a broken hand the part before, and I was you know that that was something different. But my junior. My second year, my third year, I kind of plateaued. So much of it was like I had an idea in my in my head of the type of player that I wanted to be and the type of offense that I wanted to play and the way the coach should have used me 
Um, and that wasn't happening. And I had, I, I built up kind of this kind of youthful resentment that you have of why, why aren't things working the way I want them to work out, which I think for all athletes in, in every sport, you know, I, I know in basketball, that happens a lot, you know, because you have an idea of yourself and how things should work out. And then it becomes the coach's fault and everybody else's fault. And before my senior year, you know, my junior year was not good. I, I didn't play well at all. And before my senior year, I did a, a, a semester abroad. It wasn't semester. It was a quarter abroad in Barcelona. And I didn't pick uh -huh. up a basketball at all. And I just kind of enjoyed myself. But I, I thought, and I was just like, I told myself, you know, if there's only one specific way I can play or only one type of coach I can play for, then maybe I'm not that good a player. You know, I have to be able to adjust the different types of, of, of ways of playing and different types of coaches, you know, otherwise it's on me. And I was going into my senior year and feeling like I hadn't kind of lived up to expectations, my own expectations and other people's expectations. So I went and went to my senior year with a completely open mind that I was going to, I was going to do it the coach's way and I was going to do it the best way I could. And everything just kind of fell into place. I, I played really well. I shot better than I ever shot in my life and ended up getting all conference. And, you know, that, that was kind of the jump and allowed me to go play into Europe. But so much of it was, was just, it wasn't really any difference in how I played. It was just shifting, shifting that, that, the way I approached it and the, and, and the mentality of it. Yeah. And that's, it's, it, that's really interesting because um, a lot of younger players, like you said, will, will at some point in their career come across a, a coach that, that doesn't necessarily, you have an agenda in your head. You, you want to do all these things Like you want to get shots. You want to get offensive boards. You, you want to handle the ball and, and they're, they have their agenda and, some of those things that you want to do are being done by other players. So you're left with whatever the coach wants you to do and has brought you in for. And if he hasn't communicated that very well, or even if he has, you might not accept that. And all of a sudden there's this struggle between the player and the coach. And in your head, resentment builds up. It, um, it's definitely happened to me at points with different coaches and being able to try and get past that as a younger person with an ego, it's very difficult. So it's incredible that, that you kind of had that realization moment in, in Barcelona just by leaving and not playing basketball, just to be able to kind of look at things differently and change the mindset. It's, it, that's, quite, that's quite interesting. I think for younger players, definitely, that's, it's a good one to learn from because you can find yourself in a rut very quickly if you're sitting on the end of the bench or you're, you're not in the position yeah. you want to be yeah. in or, or somebody else is getting all the shots or whatever it happens to be. Right. And I, and I mean, it's not to say, listen, I mean, some coaches are just bad coaches and you probably shouldn't play <laughs> for them, right? But I think for me, you know, here in the States, here in the States, I mean, you're pretty much going to play your four years of college and that's it, right. you know, unless you do really well. And I knew that I wanted to kind of come and play in Europe and I wasn't, I wasn't playing well enough to do that. It was kind of make or break for me. Um, and and I I remember kind of one day, walking on the beach in Barcelona and just saying, you know what, I'm going to completely just let go. Whatever the coach wants to do, like I'm just going to do my best at that and make that work. And it ended up having the opposite effect where the coach started to trust me and trust me to take more shots. And then I was able, able to kind of have the season I, w I wanted to have. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I've seen so many good players shoot themselves in the foot because – they they want things to be the way they want them to be right and yeah. if every player is doing the same thing it's never going to work you know? yeah and that's i mean yeah like you say you can see that even at the highest level in the nba where there's multiple guys on the team that all want to be the scorer or, right you know, it's generally the scorer right it's a, <laughs> it's a, there's right. a lot of it you don't see guys like <laughs> can be like i want to be the guy that sets the screens it's it's generally the scorer um so yeah uh, it's just it's tr it's it's difficult thing to do because you might let go of parts of your game that you think are are good but ultimately it, it is a team sport and you, you can't let that pass you pass you by as, as a player 
That's the way I see it. I mean, and as a younger player, sometimes exactly. you're if you're the best player on the team and you're doing all the scoring, and then you go into a situation where someone else is doing that, it can be hard to accept, and that's when you start to, you know, get annoyed. Where so it's it's almost setting your own expectations going up to the. If you're going up a level, you need to realize that you may not be able to do. Unfortunately, sometimes exactly what you want to do, you have to accept the role. Unfortunately, <laughs> right. not to crush yeah. people's dreams or anything, but you do, you do. It's the same in life, right? It's same, same as when you go into a new job. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is it, it's accepting the role, but it's also allowing the coach to, to trust you, right? And the more trust you get, the more you're going to be allowed to take shots, the more you're going to be able to 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 expand your role, you know? Yeah, that, uh, and that's and, a good, good way to think of it. Yeah, true. So, yeah, I mean, it's, but that being said, listen, I played for a lot of bad coaches too, where just, it, it was never going to happen. And, you know, it's, it's always that kind of give and take. Yeah. You kind of have to read the situation. <laughs> yeah. Generally, if the coach isn't, isn't, isn't great, then you'll probably pick that up from the rest of the team as well. You know? Right. Not, not to trash on coaches, but sometimes coaches are just not, you know, maybe it's not that they're bad, but they're just out of their depth. And they're, I've seen that before as well. But yeah, just, just depends on the situation. Okay. So college sounds like you kind of had a good last year. And then did, I kind of asked this to a few people now. Did you know at that point that you were going to go play professionally or did you kind of have anything else in mind? Or were you just like, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to try and go play in Europe for, I mean, I, I had nothing else in mind. If I didn't go play professionally, I don't, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, I so before my uh, junior year, our team did a two-week tour of, of Portugal, and we played teams, professional teams in Portugal. And, man, I loved, I loved it. I loved it so much. I just loved the lifestyle. I loved the basketball out there. And I knew, like, okay, I, wanted, I definitely want to do this for a few years afterwards. Um, I remember it was one game we played Portugal Telecom. The team doesn't exist anymore. They were in, they were down in, um, I think they were in Porto. I don't know. But the game was on TV. It was like a preseason tournament. It's on TV. And I was just like sprinting up and down the court. And I had a really good game. And the announcers were calling me in Portuguese, the Atomic Rat. <laughs> so that, that, became, that became my nickname for like the next, the next year on the team. They were calling me the Atomic <laughs> Rat. Um, it doesn't sound like a great nickname, does it? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. I guess it was supposed to be a compliment. I, you know, I kind of liked it because I was like, "Oh man, that sounds cool." I'm like the little guy, like oh, right, up and down the, the court, you know, the, yeah. the atomic <laughs> rat. Um, so it was kind of funny. Uh, so I knew that's what I wanted to do, man. I, I just, uh, you know, I just kind of had to figure out how to do it. And because my dad is British and I had. Always, always had a British passport. Oh, of course, yeah. it made things easier because there's a quota of Americans. Um, in each you know, league. Obviously, it's, it's different at league to league. But in those days, it was pretty standard. You would have two Americans, uh, two Europeans, and then the rest were, were, were national players. So um, having a passport meant I was much more in demand, which helped a lot. Um, and I got a, I got a gig going to France my first year. It worked out great. Um, I remember the coach called me and he said, Hey, we're at this beautiful beachside town called La Havre. You know, you're going to love it. We're looking for a point guard. You know, I didn't know anything about it. I said, okay, you know, sign me up. And I show up there and it's like, it's like, uh, Rena, you know, it has a reputation in France as being like the armpit of France, it's like <laughs> oil refineries and factories, like all as soon as you, as soon as you're driving for 15 minutes, all oil refineries it smells as oil when you get in there, burning right. oil, the beach, right. is, it's like a rocky beach, you can't even go to the beach. But, uh, but I was, but I was there, you know, I was in Europe. I mean, once you got your foot in the door, like. I was in Europe, man, and I, I loved it. Like, it was just, it was, like, so stimulating culturally. I was out, like, trying to learn the language and meeting people. And, you know, I, they gave you a car and apartment. I was driving into Paris all the time. And, you know, it was just, like, the lifestyle that I, that I wanted. And I wanted to see the world like that. Um, and it was a... Uh, 
you know, I was playing pro A in France the first year and it was like, it was like being thrown into the fire. Like I had, I had these a couple of veterans on my team who had played in the NBA. We were playing against, uh, you know, some NBA guys and top level guys and, you know, like I had to, I had to get it together quick or I was going to get sent home. You know, I had to take it really seriously and do my best. Um, so man, it was, yeah, it was, it was really a wild year. I mean, we could do a whole podcast just about that year. It was just, <laughs> it was just, it, it really was, it really was like a incredible learning experience, but also just so many stories. That year. Yeah. It, it, it's an experience in itself, just going doing that for a year and then having the freedom just to, cause you get a lot of downtime, right? So you just, you're figuring you're going to travel around the country and you're driving everywhere and, just you get a lot of downtime. I mean, which is like the, the 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 good and bad thing. I mean, when I was there, this is 2002. You know, I didn't even have a cell phone when I first went there. You know, Skype wasn't really a thing yet. So I used to go down to the corner store and get a calling card, scratch it off, and that's how I call America when I was first there. Um, so you really have to be, you really have to get into the country and the culture. You, you can't just sit on your phone and FaceTime with people all day long or, you know, it's just, or get on social media. We just didn't have that. Like you really had to dive into the, into the culture. Yeah. And um, I just, again, don't mind you bring it back to me because it's kind of your story here, but I just remember sitting on a park bench in Germany trying to speak German to a 70 year old when I arrived over there. And I had some from school and it was the most difficult conversation I've ever had. <laughs> but it was just, sure. like you said, you gotta, you gotta try because you're, you're in a different country and you want to try and interact. So you just, <laughs> just kind of find a way. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, mean, okay. mine, yeah. My, my, I mean, I'll just say mine was kind of the classic story where I met a, a French girl that I ended up um, dating for a while that, uh, didn't speak English, so I'd have to show up there with my dictionary and have to look through all the words. And I mean, that's how I, that's how I learned French when I first got there. Oh, right, there. okay. So you picked up like a, re, like a conversational amount of French here? By the time I left, I, I spoke really well. I mean, I would uh, probably say I was pretty close to fluent, you know, but that was, that's now 13, 14 years ago since I was there. So now it's probably conversational at this point they basic conversational i've just forgotten so much yeah just it does help when you're in the country with the pronunciation i found it's i know it sounds really um obvious but like the stuff sure. i learned in school versus when i actually moved to it to, 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 oh, Ger yeah. to germany it, yeah i just found that you can actually start pronouncing the words properly and you can actually speak like not like you know what i mean like close to a local you know they'd still know you're not from the from France. Oh, yeah, they know. <laughs> yeah, right. well, they'll, they'll tell you fairly quick, but but um, yeah, interesting. That's good that you learned the language because I mean, I'll be honest with you, uh, the American I, I was with didn't didn't have any uh, attention. To yeah, I mean, I you know, I think there's so many good American players who go play in Europe, and I think that the difference between the, the ones who can actually make a career of it and the ones who end up getting sent back home are the ones who are adaptable, who, who can go there and who can you know, try and learn the language. You could meet people and have friends. Who, and also the food. I mean, it sounds sounds like a small thing, but you have to kind of be able to get into the local the local cuisine and the local food. You can't always have the, the thing you're used to. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, the guys the guys that did really well were the guys who who could adapt quickly. You know, that. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Actually, I never never thought about it that way. But just the, it's the day to day stuff, the everyday stuff. That it, if that is bugging you and the basketball isn't going well as well, you're not going to hack it for oh man a year. This yeah. is your this is your life. This is your everyday for this is not like you know like exactly. it becomes very much like yeah, uh, it's going to bother you after a while if you don't like the food and you don't like the you don't get on with the people right. and you're you're not trying to integrate and you're not trying to learn the language. Yeah. Eventually, you're just going to be like well. Am I wasting my time here? This, you're almost going to talk yourself out of it if you're not enjoying the basketball, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's also, listen, I mean, this is work. I mean, this isn't like just college basketball, high school basketball. This is a work, you know? And they have to, 
the coach and general manager and other players, they have to like going to work with you every day. You know, that's mm -hmm. another thing. If, if you're kind of a somebody who shows up and you're moody and you don't want to hang out with the, with the guys and stuff and you start playing bad, man, they'll send you home real quick. I mean, it's cutthroat, man. I learned that quick. Like, you know, we went my second year, we went through 25 players, 30 players. I mean, guys started playing bad on the plane. Next day, some guy shows up for two games. Hey, man, you're not the one. Send them home. Like, it, it can be brutal. It can really be brutal. So you you have to you have to like learn the politics of it and you have to you have to adapt. Yeah, yeah, and I, I saw the same thing. A lot of uh, someone's going to be on a flight next week if we don't start playing halftime speeches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which yeah, I was shocked well, again. You're shocked the first time you hear that. You're like you're shocked because you think these people are going to be in and then they're gone the week this preseason, you know, and they're just gone the next week and there's like new guys showing I know, up. Oh man, it's crazy. I mean, the other thing is they'll they'll threaten they'll threaten to fine you, and I'm like, didn't I sign a contract? What do you mean you're you're gonna just fine me because we lose? And all of a sudden you get your you get your money the next month, and you know half of it is missing, and they're like, oh yeah, but we lost three games in a row, so we're fining you. What? You know, it's just it's so it's so like quirky like that. It's and it, 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 it man, it can wear you down sometimes for sure. Yeah, it's interesting, and that probably again is certain countries are worse for that. And I, I just, oh yeah, yeah, because I, I got I got told um, another guy, you know Ralph Bucci, you know Ralph Bucci, right? The yeah, he played yeah. The, from the UK, from from America, uh, for GB. I think he played for GB, right? Uh, anyway, yeah. I mean, Ralph was playing in the BBL for many years and was a top player in the BBL. Um, so Ralph told me he played in, I think he played in first league. Uh, I want to say first league Greece. Which we can get on to to, to your your stint in Greece in a minute, uh, but he told me this he there he this was like a year two years later, he was still trying to get the money he was owed from Greece. I couldn't. Oh yeah, well, I mean uh, we could talk about that. I, I he said a lot of money though. He said like uh, he saved a lot of money. Like it was like. I mean I've heard so many stories. I heard, I you know I've heard stories of guys who like. The, the, their own team would ro like rob them like they had the money in there they gave them cash had the money in their apartment they left when they went back to their apartment the money wasn't there you know stuff like that but when i was i mean we can talk about greece let's just jump into it when i was in greece you know i was i was only there for about three months and i had moved from slovakia which was a whole nother situation which is which was like i mean I mean, hilarious, that whole situation. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you about Slovakia real quick. I was in Slovakia, and the coach So, so just to fired. give people the context, you did four years in France, right? Four years and in France. And then you did Spain, and then two Spain, years. Spain a year, then UK two, two years, years, then right. back to Spain, and then you're in Slovakia, just to get the timeline. <laughs> so, so, so this is essentially my last year playing. I didn't know it at the time. Right. So I, you know, I played kind of a little bit with, with in GB the next year, but it's my last year playing. So I go to Slovakia and I show up there and it's like a, this little industrial town um, next to a really nice town. So I, I'm staying in a nice town with this beautiful castle, but I'm in this little industrial town. And I show up there and the coach, uh, as soon as I get there, gets fired. Right. So we've got they, they don't want to spend any money. So they hire a guy from Portugal who happened to be there because he married a, a Slovakian woman and coaches volleyball, doesn't coach basketball. They decide to let him be the basketball coach. He doesn't speak Slovakian or English, right? <laughs> doesn't speak so Slovakian. There, doesn't speak Slovakian, doesn't speak English. So we're there trying to have practices. And because he, he speaks a little Spanish and I had lived in Spain, I end up trying to communicate with him in kind of this like quasi-Spanish. And then telling the other guys in English and then told the guys in Slovakian, I mean, it was just like madness. And then we had, every time we'd lose, they would fine us and take all our money, you know. <laughs> Again, this is it was like, it was like a pyramid scheme. Yeah, it was like a pyramid scheme. You know, they tell us they were going to pay this amount of money. As soon as we lose, they take all our money and save that money and they pay us with that money for the next month. It was just oh so ridiculous. Gosh. That's and then so we had serious. kind of like the craziest team. The guys would bet on the games and... I mean, I could go on and on about Slovakia, and I was only there about four months. That being said, though, I, I love Slovakia, man. I mean, I really did. Like, the food was great. It was, it was cheap. You know, 
it was fun. It was gorgeous. Um, I actually really enjoyed my time there in the country. But the team was just like, it was like so ridiculous that it was almost like a comedy sketch, you know? It wasn't <laughs> like I was like, I wasn't even, at a certain point I wasn't even mad. I was like, this is like hilarious. Surreal. Like what is happening? It's just so surreal. So anyway, I get an offer to go to go to Greece to play a, a, for Ike, which is a big team, you know? It's a big Famous team, yeah. Team. Mm -hmm. Famous team. So I'm like jumping on it. So as soon as I get there, I realize how bad everything is. The country, Greece is falling apart. This is, this is when Greece was going through their big issue. Oh, yeah. Um, my team had already run through about 30 players. They were in last place. They had never in the history of their team in 100 years been demoted, right? So we're in last place. They have no money because their owner is the owner of uh, Sage or Fage Yogurt, right? They're yeah. going bankrupt. So I get there, and they, never, they don't pay me. They don't pay anybody. They put us in a hotel. We have to move from our stadium because they never paid the bills for the right Athens. Um, so it's, but it's nice. I'm, I've got a hotel on the beach, you know, everything, everything otherwise is really nice, even though the country is kind of falling apart, you know, there's protest every day. So we go to play our very last game. We've got a win and the team we're competing with, who's also tied with us in the standings has to lose for us to stay up. And they tell us, if you stay up, We'll give you your money, right? <laughs> we'll give you your money. Everything's going to be fine. So our fans pack into this little gym. They're going crazy. They're throwing, like, you know, uh, fireworks inside the stadium. Going, they're, they're going nuts. Like, they're on edge because everything is on edge in Greece anyway. They're on edge because they've never been demoted ever. And if you if you know anything about Greece basketball, Greece sports in general, like, crazy. it's so much of your identity like the team you, su you support that it's just, it's on another level of anywhere I've ever seen. So the end of the game, we're up by like five points. Looks like we're about to win. Our, our fans are banging the drums, going crazy. The other team is on the road. They're playing a good team on the road. Comes out like last second, they make a shot, they win. So we get demoted, right? So this is, this <laughs> news is coming through in our, in our, this news is coming through. So our fans are there. They start going crazy. You know, they're, they're upset. All of a sudden, it's silent. It's like, first, it's silence. It's like a funeral. The game ends. We find out what's going on. We go into our locker room. Everybody's down. And it's like a riot. They're, they're like flipping cars over and throwing <laughs> Molotov cocktails. They don't want to leave. You know, they're, they're, they're angry at us. Like, it's like they want to kill our own fans want to kill us. Like, so oh, they call goodness. in, they call in like the National Guard or I don't even know what it is, you know, to make, to make human shields with real shields so we can go through and go into like an armored bus to get out of there and go back to our hotel. And that was the last game. So then the next day, general manager comes to me and says, hey, you know, if you, if you just hang out here a couple more weeks in your hotel, like. We'll get you some of your. We'll get you most of your money. And I was like, just give me a plane ticket. Like I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out of here, man. I'm absolutely done. You know? That's crazy. No more. And I kind of knew then. I kind of knew then. I was like, I, I think, I think I'm done with pro basketball. <laughs> like this is, this is pretty much the. This is pretty much, you know, after Slovakia and then Greece, I was like, this is pretty much the end of the line for me, man. That's, I'm, 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 I've had it. You just went to the epicenter of chaos, Greece, in the crisis. It's like Ireland and Greece are the and, two worst countries in terms of the, oh, yeah. from the crisis. I and mean, then, it's crazy because you, you would drive down the street and make a right turn, and all of a sudden there'd be like 10,000 people in the street protesting. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a rough time then. It really was. Yeah, I mean, the people couldn't put out money out of the ATM. The, the, there was like a run. Right. Everyone was trying to take their money out. There was a run on the banks, and... and they basically were like, no, you can't take out more than yeah. 60 euros or whatever it was. Yeah. Greece was like tell you the what, worst. Mm. I'll tell you what, though, like it was a, it was a crazy time and nobody had any money and nobody was employed. But 
every time you go to the cafes or the bars or the clubs, man, they're still packed. They're still <laughs> packed in Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably in Ireland too. I wasn't here, but like, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I did come back for that one year. Yeah, I don't think it stops them from that point of view. There's always enough disposable income to go down to the pub. That's generally how it works. But, uh, there you no, go. That, that's that, that's a that's a crazy story. I didn't I didn't know that at all. Didn't get to that on the last time. And, and you were on the, the one of the biggest teams that got demoted, and you were at the last game that they got demoted. So that's yeah. So I mean, even even so, I'm, I guess our, our team is infamous for being the only team ever to be demoted from the first division for Ike in like 110 years or whatever. Well, now now they've moved back, and they're a really good team. I think they won the Euro Cup or one of those kind of second level European cups. Um, so Panathinaikos, Olympiakos, and I think that's the other big team. It's Athens, right? It's, it's AEK Athens. Athens. Yeah, yeah I Athens. Yeah, right. yeah. That's 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 crazy. Yeah, like I mean, you do hear even at the football games, like you see the the referees getting escorted off, and like Olympic or uh, Greek sports generally, the, the, they're passionate. So they're passionate. They're nuts, man. I mean, their passion is like it's amazing like it really is amazing man yeah, i mean that that's the one thing you come from somewhere like playing in the bbl in england or you're kind of you're having to give tickets away to people and begging people to come like you go to greece passion is just incredible you know but it's also there's this other side of it the, the violence and that which is difficult you know you're watching the news and they say oh yeah one person was killed at the at the at the football match today and you're like what you know like it's <laughs> Like it's, it's normal like a common yeah. occurrence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I the first time I, I really encountered Greek people, I I was just because I was born and raised in Ireland, went to university in Aberdeen, Scotland, actually. Um, and I spent the summer in Aberdeen and I had to house with random people and I got put with a, a Greek guy who was uh, trying to be a doctor. And he was at the window, I remember he was in his sandals and he was having this conversation with a Greek woman who's on the other side of the window. And I walked in and I, I left because I thought they were having an argument. And I came back in. I was like, what was all that about? And he was like, oh, we're just having a conversation. And they were pretty much shouting at each other. And, and they were just having this massive debate with like, they weren't even standing, you know, the, the one person was outside the window and they were just having this mm -hmm. crazy conversation. And I was like, okay, Greek people obviously have, they're quite hot-blooded or, you know, well, even compared to an Irish They're expressive. I mean, I think Mediterranean yeah. people in general, you know, it, it is the same. Yeah, you know, it's even southern southern France, you know, there can be can be expressive. But yeah, Greece is Greece. Greece was unique. I mean, I love the experience. I'm so glad I went there. Um, it was beautiful. The beach was beautiful. The food was amazing. I mean, there's so many great things. But man, what what a like three months that I was there. Just from the basketball standpoint, completely nuts. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because the one the one commonality around you know basketball teams is the people, and that's a lot of times what you remember. Certainly from my experience as well is is the people on the teams. So that that's generally the most interesting part: the coaches, players, yeah. uh, fans, and all that kind of stuff. So it. I mean, that, it's, that's all the memories, right? It, man, it is like a sociologist dream, you know, <laughs> how all these different people come together. Yeah. And make it work. And I was on, you know, in, in my years in Europe, I was on so many different teams in different countries. And some worked really well and guys really liked each other. And some guys hated each other and didn't get along at, at all. So, I mean, that was another fascinating thing. I mean, somewhere like Greece, where you, where you got new guys showing up every other week, it was, it was, it was, it was very unique, to say the least. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, okay, so I, we kind of jumped around the timeline. It doesn't matter. Uh, so f you did four years in France. So you're you're saying that the level in France is pretty is pretty good, and that's what I've heard too. Is is it's a good level? It's quite an athletic league, um, generally pro A and pro B. Um, so you did four years there. Uh, then you moved on to Spain, and then you came back to the UK. Was there a reason why you came back to the UK after Spain? Or yeah, it, I hadn't just... planned on it. I I was playing with the GB team the summer before. Um, ah, okay. And I actually, I actually got hurt, um, so I didn't play the first half of, of the next season. I okay. had to, I had to get a surgery, a sports hernia surgery. So 
the GB t team said, well, we'll supplement your salary if you stay here in the UK. And, and so you can rehab and then be ready for the next GB season. So I ended up going and playing in Leicester and then having to get another surgery um, for the same issue. So it wasn't like, it, did, it didn't work out quite quite the way I wanted. But um, I mean, the BBL, man, the BBL, we could talk about that all day. BBL does have some issues, and especially back then. But I actually really enjoyed my time in Leicester. I loved playing for Rob there. And I had some some good friends and good teammates. And um, and Le Leicester was actually, I actually kind of warmed to it. I like Leicester a lot. Yeah, Leicester. So Rob Padanostra was the coach. I don't know if he's still there anymore. Um, yeah, he's still there. He's still going strong, he? man. Wow. I mean, he's a great, great coach to play for, man. He really, he's, he's, he's one of my favorite coaches. Really great guy. Um, and kind of, kind of under, he played himself, so he kind of understands what players need. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, he's had some success there. They've won a few things now since he's taken over. They've kind of risen up now to be one of the best teams consistently over the last number of years. And it, assuming he's still there, he's obviously a big part of that success. Um, so I think the Eagles, so you play for the Eagles for one year, so that's going to be um, player coach, uh, whose name is now eluded me. Um, yeah. Fab, Fab. Fab Flornick. Fab Flornick. Yeah, I never the, actually, I never actually played for, I went there for about three uh, weeks, and then right uh, before my first game, I got an offer to go play in, in Spain, so I jumped, jumped on a plane and, and played in Spain, uh, kind of my second class year okay. but that was that was kind of towards the end of my career i was wearing down and all the kind of jumping around it it started it started to wear me down the, the that the league you played in spain led gold right so that i mean that's a yeah that's actually a, like i think you played in the eva league right so that's a huge jump there from eva to like what was the no i, I played no? in uh, i played in lev i started in lev two with lev two. rosalia and then i played in lev one and then i went uh, back okay. to lev one or I guess they call it Love Gold, Love for the Gold. Rimse, which is, uh, wood, I, don't, I don't know what it's like now, but it used to be a very good league. Yeah. Um, used to be uh, definitely better than, than Pro B in France. Yeah, I mean, it's the one down from the ACB, which is the second right. best league in the world, really. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a good standard. Um, how many Americans are they allowed? Just like saying again, two Americans and then... I think at that time it was just two Americans and then I think maybe three European players, um, something okay. like that. Yeah. 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 And a lot, just for anyone that's kind of not aware of how they generally they, they work is because they're only allowed two Americans, they'll try and pick up American players who have European passports. They're like, that's your kind of extra American. And in some cases they'll have two extra right. Americans who have European passports. So for someone well, like you, who's played at a high level in college, who has a European passport, you almost have, you're like the third American that they can just bring in. So you're, you, you've you got a great chance of getting picked up. Uh, like that's the way, uh, it certainly was explained yeah. to me, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, every, it's interesting, right? So you, if you play in the UK or France, like it's, it's difficult to get a passport from that country or somewhere like Spain, if you've got any kind of loose connection to the country or, or you marry a Spanish woman, or even, you know, you can get a passport really quickly. Um, you know, I, in the UK, I remember for the GB team, which tried to get Azubuki, who played in Kentucky, played in the NBA, who was born in England, he couldn't get a passport because his, his mother was there illegally when he was born. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's complicated the way, from, the way it changes from country to country. Okay, yeah, it's yeah, it's got different rules in in each country. Yeah, okay, um, okay, so kind of covered that in Spain. The the one thing I wanted to ask you about is so you, you obviously had your time with GB and when you played on the on you had thirty four caps for GB, right? That's a lot, a lot of caps, actually. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. and like particularly enjoyed that, like just in terms of being able to play for the national team. You played at the 2009 Eurobasket Championships in Poland. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. Wow. So what, what did you kind of learn from that, take away from that, from like a basketball point of view? 
Yeah, I mean, that was probably, I mean, playing with GB was my favorite time playing basketball in my life, you know, and, and that was kind of, for me, you know, because I, I didn't play in the Olympics with the other guys, that was kind of the culmination. I was playing in the European Championships. Um, I mean, we were in Warsaw. It was a big deal. You had fans from all over Europe. But we, I mean, that tournament for us, we were put in a group of death. We played, so we played without Luau Deng. He didn't play in that tournament. We played against Spain, right. who was the second best team in the world, maybe even the best team in the world, because they were coming off the the the, your, the uh, world championship right before that. They just won the world championship. Just won. So they had, we played them the first game. They had the Gasol brothers. They had Ricky Rubio. They had Rudy Fernandez and, and, um, What's what's my guys? Juan Carlos Navarro, one of the Navarro. great, great, great European La players. Bamba. Ever. Yeah. La Bamba. What I mean, what a player he was. Yeah. Garbajosa. I mean, these guys were loaded. Fernandez. So we're playing them, man. They, you know, they take us lightly. We're playing them. We're down like 15 points going into like the third, middle of the third quarter. We go on a roll, man. Like we just get hot. Ranking hits a couple. Jared Hart hits a couple. All of a sudden, with about two minutes to go, we're we're leading. We're up two points, right? Place is going Crazy. like nuts. So in the end, you know, with about a minute to to go, we're still up. Kyle Gasol hits a three pointer. You know, never sh- at that that time in his career, he was ne- he wasn't shooting. Wasn't shooting those, yeah, yeah. Wasn't shooting it. Hits a three. You know, we come down. Shot clock violation. They come down. Hit another three, and that's the game. Next day in the paper, they were saying, you know, nearly the biggest upset in the history of basketball. You know, and there's that yeah, feeling of like, that feeling of like, oh man, we were so close, you know. And I then know, after that, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, I mean, it, yeah, it was incredible, man. And then after that, we played, uh, we played, uh, man, we played some good teams. So we played Serbia, who they finished second in the tournament, but, but behind Spain, they had t- uh, Milos Teodosic. Was an incredible player um, Bogdanovich, who's now in the who's now in the league, um, and then we played and then we played uh, Slovenia, um, who had some big time players as well. Goran Dragic, he was a point guard. He he was he came off the bench actually. Goran Dragic, that's how wow. good they were. Wow, didn't know that. Um, so yeah, incredible tournament, man. Played against some some amazing players. Uh, it was a kind of the experience of a lifetime, you know, it was like the culmination of all that work to get there. Um, and that was probably, for me, that was the pinnacle. That was the pinnacle. It really was. Yeah. And you know, like had you been in, like you said, gone over there and decided to kind of not integrate in France and decided to not play because you stuck with it. You know, that was, like you said, you kind of reaped the rewards further down the line and, hard work and opportunity that kind of old quote of we're hard work and opportunity yeah. good things happen you ended up going well, playing against some of the best players in the world and almost beat spain i remember remember watching that and thinking like that was incredible and i actually thought that that would be the pivot point for for gb basketball and it would just take off from there but i mean i know never, i know we've never, been saying that for years man i mean you yeah. know that's that's a whole nother conversation but yeah, yeah you know budget and the people in charge and so on so on but you know, they did really well to, to to get us to that point. And also, I'll give a credit to everybody for that. But yeah, man, it was, I mean, when, when you start the journey in Europe, and you're kind of in there. I mean, I think for me, the point was, I I kind of saw my potential. I saw like, I reached my, my peak and how good I can be. And just to see that, even if just for a short time, you know, I wasn't able to to keep it going was really great, you know. And I think I even remember the year before with GB, we had a practice and it was probably like after I played a great tournament in I think we were in Turkey and then we had a practice and I kind of saw like where my mental and my physical ability met. And that was really like the peak. And I think for every athlete to be able to get to see what your peak is, is kind of is really the goal you know, is really the goal. And I think, you know, I I was able to leave it. I I have regrets. I couldn't sustain that, but I didn't have a lot of regrets because I, I, I kind of got to the point where we're really like, I hit my peak physically and I hit my peak mentally and I can see it in action, even if it was just for 
one tournament or one practice, you know, that that felt great. That felt like I put all the all the work into into getting to that point. Cool. Um, that's a nice way to put it, actually. Uh, very poetic. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's it's interesting uh, that you, that that you got to to kind of to do that with GB. It's 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 incredible, actually. Um, the uh, there was something I was going to ask you about GB. Wh which guys? I mean, it's probably obvious answers to this, but which guys surprised you in terms of how good they were? Maybe so, not the more of the, the more obvious players, but like in, for GB when you played with them, like in terms of just trying to think, like was there guys in the team where did you were like? Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Well, Nate was a fantastic player. I mean, really, really. I mean, he Nate maximized his Nate Rankin. He, Nate, Nate Rankin. I mean, yeah. So the yeah, lefty, he, he, he's the older guy, right? Yeah. I know yeah. So he was a six foot one two guard, um, but he could always get a shot off. He, you know, he he moved without the ball better than anybody I've ever seen in my life. You know. If his if his defender turned his back for a split second, he was gone. He was he was to the corner. He was he was at the top of the key. You know, he was always open. He's always available. And he just he worked so hard. You know, when he I remember kind of towards the end of my time, he was maybe in his mid thirties already. And he was working harder than anybody else. He was beating everybody in the sprints. You know, he was in the best shape of anybody there. He was he was kind of like he was the guy where when your kids grow up, you say, hey, if you want a role model, he's your role model. I mean, he, he was that guy. Um, so he, he was somebody I really looked up to. He's now the coach of GB, as he should. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for that. I'm excited for where GB is going to go. Um, but we had some other ones. Drew Sullivan, he was, he was a classic case of a guy who uh, – would do anything for the team rebound pass play defense whatever it took you know he he's he's the guy that you had to have on your team to make everything work yeah. um he wasn't going to give you 20 points a night but he was going to do every little thing and he was a great great teammate great guy you know still a good friend of mine um yeah there was some i mean a lot of really good players man i mean you know Rob Archibald, you know, rest his rest his soul. He was a he was a guy who would do a little bit of everything. Um, Andy, I mean, all of them. Andy Betts, Karen, so many so many good players. Uh, Mike Lindsley was another really good player as well. I mean, I could go on and on, but yeah, it was it was just an incredible experience. It was it was it was loaded with talent. That that team was was it was a nice mix of vets and and younger guys as well. Yeah, there was, I mean, especially our big guys. We had some great big guys, you know, Pops and, and Betts and Archibald and Luau. I mean, we, we had some some really, really high-quality, world-class big guys on that team. Yeah, and, and that's ultimately when you're going to play against Spain, you, you kind of need that quality in the, in the side to compete against a, a, right. a top-class, a world-class team like Spain. You just won the, like... Still incredible. I remember seeing the the, the game and, and losing by five. It's, it's, it sounds crazy, like a you know, like whatever a pyrrhic victory or whatever you want to call it. But like the fact that you guys did that is still incredible. And, and it was a couple of shots, really. It would have been a massive upset, and like God knows what would have happened. It was very close. It's crazy. But, um, yeah, good to reminisce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to reminisce. It is, man. It was some good times, especially with GB. Man, I, that was just. Best best time of my life playing basketball was playing with GB. That's cool. It's cool. It's cool to hear that. Um. Okay. All right. Because we can go for a while. So I got a few last dance questions. Because I'm sure we started talking. Yeah. Let's do it. Over WhatsApp. Uh, Hold on. My, I'm in real quick. Hold on. Hold on. Trying to get a better connection. Is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm I, might to, I might have to go super super close for this one. I was been spending. I can't the really hear you. I'm gonna put my headphones back on. Hopefully, oh, yeah. it won't die. No worries. Hold on. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. I I just realized that I've been spending majority of the time trying to block out this light that's in the back of my head. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that. You're doing a good job of it. Yeah, I've I've just no. I was like, that's way too bright. It's gotten darker because I'm not getting no one to mirror around it. But uh, anyway, 
So um, the last dance, uh, I've been really enjoying it. Uh, it's great. Um, and then I kind of saw some stuff that came out after, and everyone's got their opinions on these things. Can you still hear me, by the way? You can. Yeah, I, I can hear you. I, I'm kind uh, of running out of battery, but I should be okay. All right, so we'll, we'll run through these quick. So, yeah, I, there's most of these people are saying amazing, brilliant, the nostalgia, Jordan, incredible, and I'm saying that too. Um, but there was something in the back of my head that 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 went off, and and genuinely hadn't seen anyone else say this. And you know, you kind of go searching, to, or you kind of go searching through articles, then that just appear on your social media, and you click on them. One of the things I I thought in the back of my head was that Jordan may have seemed like he seemed like he had his hands on this documentary a little bit. This has just went through my head. Uh, I, fe- I yeah, felt, he did. Yeah, like as in he probably got to sign off on some of the stuff that was in it. Well, his two two of his like uh, people who worked for him were producers on the documentary, so he had, he absolutely did have his okay, hands right. on it. Okay, right. So that okay that. I think I didn't know that. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Didn't know that actually, uh, interesting. All right. So, okay. Well, with that in mind, the one of the incidents in the last two episodes, the Jordan Rules book, which is Sam Smith, not the singer. Uh, yeah. Uh, so he kind of just basically, <laughs> like, very blase, just went, "Oh yeah, that was Horace Grant," and then. Uh, Horace was in the in the clip, but kind of didn't really. Obviously, they didn't show. You know, they they were showing Jordan people saying so. They didn't show Horace Grant MJ saying that he he was blaming him for leaking all the stuff that was happening to the book. And I read an article after the fact, just yesterday, actually, I think it was. The Horace Grant said that he hadn't leaked it, and that MJ's full of that. That was complete BS, essentially. And he he shouldn't have said that. And if he had a problem, he should have came up and said it to him, not put on a documentary. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, or did you just think? Man, I mean, it's an interesting question. I'm, you know, I think Jordan he's renowned for holding grudges for for years and years and years. So right. maybe that was something he was holding inside for a long time. I mean, it's interesting because I had heard before that it was Phil Jackson who had leaked everything, who, who knew Sam Smith and it actually leaked everything. It wasn't Horace Grant. That's what, that's what I had heard before, before this documentary. Yeah. So to hear that it was Horace Grant, I mean, so I, I'm assuming, you know, as a journalist myself, you're going to have to get everything verified. If Horace Grant just said a bunch of stuff, you couldn't just print it in a book. You'd have to get things verified by other people. Multiple so, sources. Is that the way it works? Right. So there would have had to be multiple people kind of saying, yes, that's true or no, that's not true or so on, so on. So otherwise you run the risk of getting sued. So um, especially in America, but uh, yeah, really, really curious how that worked. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to see Jordan's power though. Right. I mean, even, 20 years after he retired, his power that he has over his, over his teammates and general man. I mean, the things he was saying about his general, still holds a grudge over his general manager to this day, even though he's passed away, you know, he, 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 his power and his, how he was able to wield that to all these victories is amazing. But I think the thing that made me sad about the documentary was I would hope after all this time, uh, and all his success and everything, he would be able to find some peace, you know? He wouldn't kind of still be this this bitter guy who holds grudges and it still has the regrets that he couldn't go for one more title. And, yeah. you know, is I think, to me, I was a little sad to see. I, I, I would hope he'd be able to enjoy his success at this point because he was, I mean, the guy was transcendent, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting because I thought that too. Uh, and I don't know if, like, a lot of people just love the nostalgia of it and oh, Jordan, and you know, it just brings you back to a certain time with the kind of when basketball just exploded and there was such a hype around the game. Um, and I love that part of it, obviously. Um, you know, the old, the old uh, um, Jordan documentaries, and and that was great. But then there was exactly how I felt was that you think like he's a bit older now and he's not still talking about should he got the seventh championship and like when he talks about the the things that happened in the documentary he's actually like 
reliving the emotion. You can see it in his face. He's like, and I took that personal, you know? And then he's just, you can tell he's still like, he's, it's still a game in his head. And the only, the only counter argument to that is, is just, it, it takes an extreme personality yeah, to be 100%. that. It takes an extreme personality to be, to be that extremely good. You kind of have to have that, um, that kind of extreme personality to be able to push yourself to those extremes and, and I mean, those extremes. So that's it's all, it's almost it's almost like a personality disorder. I mean, seriously, it, it's almost like yeah, you know, it's, it, it, there, the cycle. Yeah, there's there's something there's something off somewhere, you know, where he's able to push himself to those extreme levels, um, and and, and kind of knock anybody in his way off their pedestal and in, in whatever way he wants to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a lack. It's a, yeah. No, maybe that's like that, but it's also, uh, um, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, you're, you're kind of like more or less a, 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 of my age, a younger, a little younger, but you, I mean, we, we grew up with this guy and he was so guarded. We didn't really know anything about him other than the kind of drips that would come out in these books. So to see him kind of open up and really be be a human was amazing. Was I mean that was the best part of the documentary to just every time they'd interview him and and his feelings about these people. I was eating that up. I loved that because we just didn't know. We didn't know anything about him. Mm. He was he was he was a god. Yeah, and it's interesting. I remember someone said something to me one time. They said if you're the best player. Um, this is a unique thing in sport if you're the best person at something you just immediately go up the social hierarchy the social ladder you're at the top so right. and then when, you, when you're at the top you just behave how you kind of want to behave and you don't really care because you're at the top you're, you're the guy so potentially outside of basketball because he's back in a basketball documentary he's talking about the game again he's gone back to that killer killer mode again and he he, he probably does have a different side to him there's no doubt where he's, he's a lot less uh, cutthroat and a lot less, like, you know, possessed. Or, or, but I think because he's back and ba talking about basketball again and he's considered the greatest of all time and he thinks he is, he's, he's not going to back down on these points. And that maybe is what makes him look so bad, well, I suppose, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they didn't mention, of course, his Hall of Fame speech a few years ago, which, yeah, so you know, was, was him just taking shots at everybody. <laughs> you know, it's, he, 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 he just, he has a hard time letting it go. And, you know, yeah. great. That's, that's, that allowed us to watch this amazing person do amazing things. So you kind of have to, have to take the good with the bad. But, well, I mean, what a fascinating guy. What a completely. Yeah. Um, legend, yeah legend and just i mean I, I enjoyed watching that i got a little confused with the timelines jumping back and forth all the time but what a, what an absolute legend i enjoyed that documentary so much yeah there's a funny funny video going out about where the guy's drawing the ears like and he starts just squiggling just uh, all the different years they keep jumping to on the timeline yeah, it's yeah, something i yeah, noticed yeah, too yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay i mean there was yeah yeah it was a bit ridiculous it was like there was no need to. I understand what they were trying to do, but I think it was a bit over the top. Uh, right. Uh, there's two other incidents in this that just came up in the last two episodes. The bad pizza food poisoning. Does that sound like horseradish, or does that sound uh, like? It was <laughs> I mean, what so a story, right? The food poisoning what a story. game. I mean, I, the flu game. Yeah. I mean, what a story. I mean, it's. Not, I'm gonna try this now. I'm gonna have to. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I I love that story. I thought that was great. I mean, it seems seems legitimate. He was so sick, and they said he was throwing up. And I mean, especially Utah, Utah. They they at that time they hated the Bulls. I mean, they weren't the kind of fans who were kind of in awe of Michael Jordan. I mean, they hated him. <laughs> they're, they're almost like a European football environment there, where if you're on the other team, they hate you. Uh, yeah. so yeah, it made sense. I mean, it's what a cool story. I mean, that's kind of one of the things, one of these great things you, you've you never heard before, which kind of changes everything. It was the food poisoning game because these guys had, he had to get Pizza Hut pizza the night before a game. Like, 
That's pizza. what this guy's eating the night before the game, too? Like, oh, wow, a full <laughs> pizza? I mean, all that stuff was just just incredible. Yeah, because I remember reading the book, and he said all he was running on was pizza and a cup of coffee the next day. I got pizza here, what? Can you hear me there? Yeah, I got to put you right here because my speaker is weak. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I, I think I read one of the Jordan books and it said he had all he had in his stomach was some pizza from the night before and some coffee. But they, yeah. they called it the flu game, but they, they didn't attribute anything to the pizza at the time. But now this pizza comes out as that was the reason. And he didn't have the flu, which means he lied about it at the time. It just didn't really, I, I don't know, it just all sounded. And then uh, one of the his security staff or his best friend that was this kind of handler was like, um, what did he say? He said, um, oh, I just knew something was fishy about the pizza. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> really? Mystic uh, handler? Like, I know. I, I mean, I think I think that's their story these days. You know, I, I don't think they, they thought a second thing about it. I mean, it's so funny. His like uh, his security staff and all those guys, his, his best friends, his best friends essentially worked for him because his. Yeah. You know, he had to be so insulated from, from the rest of the world. Everybody else wanted something from him. Like, what a life. Like, it just, what a life. That just wouldn't exist now because of social media and yeah. because of everything else, you know. But what a life he led. And, you know, it's so, it's so cool to see that. And it's just kind of quirky little security guys. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of, it, it was almost odd because, uh, you know, he's, in, in one way, it was incredible, but then after Barcelona and the, and the fame and the, the Olympics, and he just shot to a whole nother level, and then he couldn't really leave the house and just see him in there hiding out in his little hotel room, having a cigar by himself, not able to really experience the world like anyone else well, would you, be. It, I mean, you kind of got why he wanted to play baseball. You know, it made sense where he could just kind of, he didn't have to be perfect, you know? Basketball, he had to be perfect because he had to he had to hold up the image that everybody else had of him. Yeah. Right. Sure. Where, you know, I mean, how how much how miserable? I mean, how miserable that you have to be perfect all the time, and everybody else in your team has to be perfect. Because if mm -hmm. not, then, then then the idea of what Michael Jordan is is going to crumble. You know, it's yeah, like the true. how to, to keep that up those years it's just the amount of focus that you have to have and the amount of like close the world be able to close the world off is just it's it blows my mind it really does and, and i just it would never exist so of course he wouldn't play baseball he didn't have to be perfect he could strike out and he probably enjoyed that he can make errors and you know nobody cares because he wasn't supposed to be good anyway like yeah, and just and it it took him out of the at, spotlight as well, actually. Just it's freedom, him. yeah. I mean, it's, it mm. was freedom for him, like looking at those pictures and him, like how much fun he was having with his teammates. And mm. It was freedom, and then he went back to basketball, and he had to be perfect. Like, couldn't just be good. He couldn't just be great. He had to be perfect. Like, it's mm. misery, you know. It's 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 it's, true. it's 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 as miserable. I mean, I. I don't, I mean, it was misery. I, I mean, I would be miserable having a little life like that. Yeah, um, I never thought about it like that, actually. Just so much pressure to keep up that standard as well of, of his image. And because right. he was, he was essentially a clean cut guy. If you look at him in stark contrast, like the antithesis was maybe Rodman. Like, you know, he, he was just like a, a nutbag. Like, he went to Vegas and just, <laughs> that's I mean, such a crazy yeah. story. <laughs> a guy. That guy needed a therapist pretty bad, man. He was, he, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he almost sabotaged the whole thing right at the end because he wanted to go wrestle right in the middle of the world. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Let's go to practice. You know, yeah. I, I just of, think that they tolerated that as well. It was incredible. Like someone like Michael. I mean, that's somebody like Phil Jackson, man. I mean, you, you see, like, he was the perfect coach for that team. I mean, nobody else would have, would have imploded with anybody else. A guy who just said, hey, I understand. It's okay. I know who you are. I mean, it's a master. Yeah, he was, yeah. He, he was the right guy for Jordan. Yeah, I, I think I got that. I read his book, Sacred Hoops. Hey, hey Mark, my one? phone's about to die, man. So we're going to wrap it up here in a minute. Okay. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to ask you one more question about the seven championship, but I think we we know this. We kind of covered that off. We basically said um, 
yeah, he was just, he wanted perfection in everything he did. So he obviously wanted the seventh championship. <laughs> they were going to break Pip, Pippen would never have come back. Would Pippen. never come back. So they wouldn't have got it yeah. without Pippen. Wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have happened. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Phil brilliant. Knew. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I think at that point they were done. I don't know if he would have had the motivation to even do another year. He's thirty six. Yeah. I can't remember the age. Um, okay, listen, Flinder, I don't, I don't want to, don't want to die in the middle of the call. So listen, thank you very much. We're super. Sorry. Thanks, man. This has been, been fun. Uh, yeah, it's been really fun. It's probably my favorite episode so far, just because we got to talk about. We didn't talk about Shanghai. Next time we'll talk about Shanghai. We'll talk about Shanghai. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do a follow up. I also want to hear about like some of the journalism stuff because. I don't know that much about it, but it sounds really interesting. So we'll come back on and do a chat. Uh, I might do a different format. I might start trying to do some like round table stuff where we chat about like less about people's That'd journeys. Fun, man. Yeah. So I get you on, get your perspective. You have an always interesting perspective. So listen, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. All right.